Good morning, everybody. We are here um, behind bars, life behind bars with Officer Goodwin. And today we're going to crack on with infamous prisoners. I'm just going to make sure that our sound is running absolutely fine. Um, so I'm just going to look for Morris to tell me on Facebook that he can hear me OK and it's loud and clear. And then I will find Officer Goodwin, who's roaming around the wings somewhere, and I'll get him in front of you and he can begin today's... I guess it's a talk, a talk. I'm, I'm never really sure what to say at the moment. So let me let me let me bring you up, Officer G. What do you think? Is it a tour? Is it a talk? Is it's it? A, a... It's a virtual static tour. A virtual static tour. Yeah. I'm standing still. The pictures are standing still. But you're still getting the talk. That's true. We can actually. I can actually put moving images behind. We will. If you like we can. Yeah. Yeah, we can get to that stage. Uh, we are that technologically advanced. Uh, cool. I've got the thumbs up for Morris, so I know we're all good. Um, good morning, Morris, who's one of our prison officers down in Shepton yeah. Mallet. Good morning, Morris. <laughs> um, nice to have you back up. I was, I was waiting for you to carry on. No. Um, officer G, right, shall we get started? So let me, let me do the usual. Let's bring up a picture of one of our favourite prisons in the country. Uh, we'll choose this one today. Officer Goodwin, would you like to make an appearance for your oh, public? Absolutely, as they do in, in, on the presidential elections these days. I come jogging on just to prove that I can still move. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to. No, I'm not going to say anything no. political because it's no. so easy to get into trouble these they days. They all do it. When you when you say something political, I don't know. I've ever seen Donald Trump run onto her. Oh no, no, no. There's, a, there's a good. The reason for that, he can't. I think you should go off and you should come like Theresa May did that time when she went for the Conservative National Party, where she came and sort of doing the kind of half robot sort of thing. I think old Barack Obama was the first one to come jogging off. <laughs> like, yes, guys, we're going to solve the problems of the world. Yep. Okay, we I, we should. We, you know it's a really difficult one today. We should we shouldn't really be laughing too much. We're gonna we're gonna change it slightly. Right. <laughs> You've had your first comment. What? No book. No, <laughs> no book. No, we've we've taken the book away from him. Props, props department, mate. Just got rid of him. Yeah, there's a very specific reason. We've actually managed to move studios a week early. The studio's not completely finished. It's not quite there, is it? But no. um, it's certainly at a stage where we can use it. It's a little bit better than the last studio. The sound's definitely better. It's not echoing as much. Um, and Officer Good has got a lot more room to move and play with, which is what he likes. Um, so that's why we took the book away from him because he doesn't understand stationery as much anymore. Uh, so today we're doing infamous prisoners, I believe, aren't we? Uh, yes, we certainly are. Yeah, we're going to talk about infamous prisoners who some of the people out there, are, our audience, will have well heard of and others you've never heard of before. So it'll be quite interesting because uh, one of the big things about infamous prisoners, the reason why some of them stay in our memory for so long is not because of anything that they do or have done. It's because of the media. The media keep many people as infamous prisoners over many, many years. Some right back from the 1930s, 40s, 50s and 60s. But you're going to see one or two pictures today of some infamous prisoners that you'll have never heard of that have done sometimes crimes that are more horrific than some of the people that we classified as those you know infamous prisoners that we make films uh, about that's that's absolutely right and i think one of the things that i'm just gonna i'm just gonna highlight right now right at the very beginning is we are going to be showing um images of some of these infamous prisoners um we won't be showing images obviously of crimes and such like no. that but we will be showing images of these of these prisoners and a number of which still have victims and victims families um that are alive today yeah. so it, it is a very sensitive subject so we're going to take it with as much care and respect as we possibly can yeah, um it is as you if if you remember it's all it's all around sort of awareness education Education and talking about those kind of things so there probably won't be quite as many jokes dropped in today I would have thought we no, probably it, will disappear on some it, rabbit it's holes not that sure, kind of but... subject because by the nature of infamous prisoners it usually means that there's been some quite horrific crimes committed uh, there's, the, there's a few exceptions which we don't have on you today but uh, people like Ronald Biggs they were sort of train robbers uh, as a such but most infamous prisoners are in for things that are quite horrific crimes uh, which causes a lot of victims um, and I think the one we're going to pretty much stay away from today will be the craze because we talk about them so regularly anyway because of the connections yeah. with some of the prisons we own and um, just because of, of the notoriety they have. But we thought we'd actually wouldn't, wouldn't really talk about those guys too much today. So there's well, that well, little plug. Interesting enough about that, Joel, the craze are so well known. They're actually known by people that were born many years and sometimes years after the craze had died. Uh, when you think about it, Reggie Cray, Ronnie Cray died in 1995 and Reggie Cray died in 2000. And that's literally, we're talking nearly 21 years ago. And yet some of the films that have been made about the Crays have been made after their death. When you think of uh, Tom Hardy, who played a, a brilliant twin part of playing both characters, uh, that film wasn't made until probably about four or five years ago. 
Um, so the reason they're infamous is because we make them infamous and keep making films about them. Uh, how many times have you seen films about the Ripper? And I'm talking about the Ripper from London. Uh, oh, Jack the Ripper. Uh, Jack the Ripper from London. So uh, they make films about that. They've, they made films about uh, um, Christie, uh, John Christie, who uh, a film that was called Ten Willington Place. Uh, he uh, horrific crimes, uh, and these fell, and he did that in the 1940s and the 1950s. Um, but they're infamous because media keep them infamous. Uh, uh, as you say, you're going to see one or two faces here that you've never ever seen before or have completely forgotten. Uh, I've no doubt that it, with the, with the craze that the media not been involved in the Reggie craze and and that sort of scene that they built around the London scene, uh, we'd have probably all forgotten. Them. And yeah. just moved on in time, particularly for a younger generation. Anybody that's under the age of 35 or 35 or younger watching this today will only know the craze by films. You know? uh, I bumped into Reggie, incidentally, uh, when he was nearly 20 years into his life sentence. And it's really quite strange because you see those images on TV, as I saw when I was a young man, uh, all the black and whites and the documentaries about the craze. And you get this impression about them. Uh, uh, and, and when I saw him face to face, when he kind of literally walked up to me because he was on my little garden party that I was running in Gartree Prison at the time, which was then a high security prison. Uh, and it was quite strange because I expected to find somebody to come bowling up to me that was sort of a six foot, six foot two kind of bruisey kind of guy, uh, because that's the kind of image you see on the TV. Uh, they always make them look larger than life. But in reality, as I said, I think I've said it before, Reggie Craig came in at five foot seven and a half. Um, so shorter than you, just a bit. <laughs> Made me feel really good, to be honest with you. Um, but the reality the is, gangster. Yeah, that doesn't mean to say that you can't be dangerous because you're small. It was just that your image of somebody is not the reality when you see people like that. Uh, and, and it's it's weird, really, how you sort of. It's a bit like seeing a very famous film star when you're out at a train station or something. You sort of take a look and then you take a double look and then you either just pass it over for what it is. Or some people can't stop but looking and gawping. But in, well, we, in we, prisons, we, remember they're prisoners. Yeah, we saw that recently, didn't we? And, and, and I can't believe we got down a rabbit hole already. We're, we're six minutes in and we've disappeared somewhere completely different. I won't mention the name because I'm not allowed to, but I know that Officer Goodwin, because I was there, I saw him do it, gave a tour to an actor who's a method actor who wanted to understand more about their part. Yeah. And they were tiny, weren't they? Yeah. No, absolutely yeah, tiny. Yeah, he's a small guy. But if he gets an Oscar, I'm hoping to get a little mention on the side. Oh uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's going to happen. Yeah, I've not, I've not seen many Oscars for TV yeah. productions, but we'll we'll see. Anyway, let, let's let's, let's, let, let's move on. So for those of you that have just joined us, good morning. We are about to get started. Or Officer Goodwin's about to get started, I should say, on infamous prisoners. So should we start on William Hughes? Oh uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, because this is sort of the outside. Uh, you'll see William Hughes there. This is a thing that went back in right back to the 1970s. Uh, a member, I, I was aware of the craze and, and one or two others like the, uh, Ian Brady and Myra Hinney, but I was only aware of them through TV uh, and never as a, being a part of a prison officer. And I was told a story about this man while I was sitting in the training school up in Wakefield. And this was in uh, June 1977, I got the story. And the offences that he committed were committed very late 1976. But the story evolved and the reason why we were told this by the training officer was um, I think he was trying to gauge how we were going to react to it, whether we thought that we actually wanted to be in this job and now was the time to leave before we got into a prison. And I think he was looking to gauge us. William Hughes um, had committed some offences in 1976 where he sort of, sort of didn't know people in the pub, but he befriended a, a man uh, and his partner. Uh, and when they went out to the car park, um, he literally picked up a brick and he beat, uh, he beat the man, uh, severely beat the man, and, and raped um, the partner. And he got arrested for that. Uh, he got uh, uh, locked up and he was up in Leicester prison. And in early 1977, he was being taken by two prison officers in a taxi to Chesterfield Court. I think it was about the third time that he'd been uh, in, in court. So he was going for the third court. They get remanded basically on a month by month basis very often. Um, and in the back of the taxi, there would be an officer sitting behind uh, the driver, uh, be handcuffed to the prisoner who in those days was only cuffed literally to one wrist. It would be the right wrist, so they'd be sitting sort of behind the passenger. And the other officer was sitting in the front of the taxi. Um, on their way to court, the prisoner said that he needed to use the toilet, so they must have stopped somewhere. Uh, and when they got back in the car, uh, this is when um, Hughes, uh, obviously he had a... Um, access to a free hand, literally pulled out a knife that he'd managed to get through reception. 
through the searching system, whether I can't say how efficient or inefficient that was. You can come to your own conclusions, of course. And he pulled out, and it was basically what they call like, a, they used to call them sort of a bony knife. Anybody that's in the butcher's trade will know that a bony knife is relatively a long, thin, with a slight curve to it. He'd managed to steal that from the kitchen. Uh, and that was some months before, and they couldn't find it. But he pulled his knife out and he stabbed the officer in the front of the car up through the neck. Uh, and he was very, very seriously injured. He didn't die, but he was very seriously injured. And he also stabbed a number of times the officer that was next to him. Obviously, the taxi was made to stop. He retrieved the keys and then unlocked himself. And that's when he scarpered off. Uh, and then he ended up in a place called, uh, while he was on the run, um, literally the same day, in a called um, Pear Tree Cottage. Pear Tree Cottage, he ended up over the next three days taking a hostage of five people, four of whom he murdered um, by different methods, stabbing, strangulation. Uh, and the last person uh, was a, 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 a lady called uh, Gillian. Uh, and he typically took her in a car and they, they got stopped by the police in a small village. Uh, and he was literally surrounded by armed police officers. And he was trying to, as he was in the process of trying to kill her with an ax, uh, literally in the car, he got shot. It took about five shots to put him down uh, and he was killed there on the spot. And that was the very first time that I'd heard of somebody. Uh, and it does make you reflect. I thought, I'm going to be in a car one day on escort. I'm going to be doing this piece of work, taking some of these people that have committed serious offences to courts in different reasons. Uh, and it's one of those things I think the PO was trying to emphasize. You can never, ever be too careful. Uh, when it comes to searching prisoners, however much you feel that you may trust them, however well behaved they may be, you never know what their ulterior motives may be. You never know what's changed in their minds to make them behave in a way that becomes dangerous to you and obviously to the public when you're out of those doors. How, how old were you when, when, when you... I was 24 at that stage. Wow. I remember I'd never seen the inside of a prison other than yeah. doing an exam. Uh, prison life is completely different than people may imagine it to be. Uh, so I always remember that story being told to me, and it sort of sat in my mind for years. And I mentioned it to other officers throughout the years, and even then they said, no, I can't remember that person. And I'm quite sure there's very few people, if hardly anybody, out in the audience today that would actually say, I remember that. And yet he killed, murdered four people, uh, and literally attempted to murder a third, not counting the rape that he committed before and the serious offences against the two staff. The serious assaults against the two staff. I'm, I'm Completely just... forgotten. Mind he was shot dead, of course. Yeah. Uh, but um, others have been shot dead and they're still remembered. But I'm just trying to think of what it would be like. I'm just trying to remember what I did when I was 24. I think I was just. I think I just joined the leisure service and I was. Uh, I've been a lifeguard for maybe a year or so. And obviously, we'd, we'd heard stories about you know potential drownings and stuff like that. And I think it was one of those. But trying to imagine being 24 in your first kind of, I guess real real job your career mm. and one of the first things being told is is something like that good and, and almost being told be careful yeah because if you're not careful it, this can happen to oh, you I, I, I think that's why the, the, the principal officer was the training officer time literally told that story because he told it very early on in the course and i think the idea behind that is to gauge our reaction and say you know if you think this isn't the job for you because yeah. those are potentially some of the risks that you're going to take uh, oh and be very careful if you're taking people on escort, you never leave anything to chance. Now it's different today, of course, prisoners don't travel like that anymore. If they're taken by a taxi by staff, they should be double cuffed. They should be properly strip searched before they leave so the reception. You've got, you got boss chair now as well, haven't you? Yeah, so you've got you boss see. chairs, which are things that detect electronic stuff or metal bits of people yeah. around people. But they're double cuffed and they're cuffed and the officers must sit in the back of the taxi as well. There'll be nobody sitting in the front seat. Um, so basically them are sort of standard procedures. Uh, that came about but uh, yeah so that was the very first person that i remember and, and they said he's infamous because of his crimes um but nobody's ever heard of him since 1976. what a way to start your career blimey mm -hmm. I, I just i just it, the mind baffles me i'm just trying to think of how you how you kind of how you process how you deal with that well i can tell you the classroom there was just this complete stony deathly silence as he was telling the story you could see all the staff were literally taking in this information do you think literally thinking it through thinking that could be me 
that could be, you know, that that's how, you know, these are some of the risks that we must accept yeah. in this job. I, There's some I desperate can't, men. I can't imagine G4S or Securicore or anything like that training their staff in that way for the private prison. You know, I, I, can, I can't know. see G4S sat in a classroom going, hey, when this, like, you know, this could happen no. and telling those stories. I, I, I don't know because I'm retired for five years now and I've obviously haven't been into a training school for many, 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 many years. Uh, so I have no idea of the kind of stories that are related to young staff that are coming into the job. I think it might be nice for staff that have been around a long time to tell them some of these stories just to keep them switched on a little bit. Never, but, ever. Don't always be aware. Always the, be aware. There's a great comment here, and hopefully Je Jessica, who's made it, will then will will hopefully um, uh, embellish a little bit more for us. But she said by the time she was 24, she'd been a serving prison officer for five years. Yes. So in when she was you 19. started young, yeah. I don't, I don't know how old she is now. Um, I'm not going to fall into the trap we did the other no, week no, where no, I take a guess no of, problem, of yes, Facebook up, profile photos. Up, um, up until that time, I was busy being an engineer in Australia, believe it or yeah. not. Yeah. Okay, where, should, where do you want to move on to next? Have you got a... Uh, uh, it doesn't matter. You throw them up and we'll talk about them because there's no real, there's no real time element to this. It doesn't make any difference when these offences happened, of course. So. Okay, well, let's, let's move up to, I guess, one that's... I wouldn't say relevant at this time. You're going to need to step either to your left or to your right. Yeah, but I'll put it up. Let, let's bring up. Um, oh, that's the wrong click over here. Let's bring uh, up right. we can this see man. That. Just just because I'm thinking of coronavirus vaccines, lots of people are going to have to visit doctors. Everyone's going to have to get injected. You know, it, it just <laughs> there's, there's a slight relevance there. Yeah, just to make you a little bit paranoid <laughs> to get your COVID-19 jab, ladies I, and gentlemen. I, I'm just, I'm just going to say, I'm just like when we've moved the studio, Harriet's now sat behind me rather than in front of me where we were previously, and somebody has just hit me on the back of the head. So I think everybody that goes to get the COVID-19 yeah. job, as the doctor says, oh, just be gentle. This will, this won't take long. Um, mind you, they will be given by nurses, of course, not by yeah. doctors. But so, yeah, Harold Shipman. Uh, can you just drop that little bit of writing in the link? Uh, Harold Shipman. He's probably relatively well known because because he's not that long ago, uh, of course. Uh, a doctor, a well-trusted doctor, and a doctor for many, many, many years, you know. He didn't get picked up for these offences until well into his 50s, if not his 60s. Um, he was um, arrested and charged with X amount, um, I believe about 10 or 15, and they could sort of pin down for the conviction. But the reality is, is they suspect that he may be responsible up into two to possibly 300 other yeah, deaths. Yeah, it was loads, wasn't it? Loads. Other deaths. Um, you know, so, and this is a man that's educated, intelligent, probably had a reasonable life being brought up through the educational system because he obviously went on to do grammar school and obviously went on to do degrees and doctor's degrees can be really quite sort of long and involved as well. Yeah. Um, so the reality is uh, we always tend to sometimes judge people sometimes by their educational level, uh, by the way sometimes film show. This was an intelligent, well-educated man. And that's possibly why he got away with it perhaps for as long as he did because he came across as being plausible and trusted, and, of course. And somebody that just fits into society. You wouldn't, you wouldn't well. look yep. at him and go, that's out of the norm. And he would, yep. like you say, trusted, and he'd been a, um, a pillar of the community and, and, yep. and part and parcel of it. Yeah. And of access to all around. those very, very serious drugs, um, access to knowing how to apply these things, all those things. Now, Har Harold um, Shipman took his own life, of course. He, I can't remember how long he did in prison, not that long, but 18 months, perhaps a bit longer. Uh, but he decided that obviously he was never going to get out uh, ever. Um, so he decided uh, that, he, that he was going to take his own life, which he did. But there's not a lot else to say about Harold Shipman. No, I think, I think like you say, it's, 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 a, it's a prevalent one because of the, the level of trust. And it, it's, I guess it's interesting how as society and as individuals, we give uh, people a level of trust, um, uh, you know, doctors, teachers, politicians, although nobody seems to trust a politician. Um, and, you know, we do find on different occasions that we, we have some uh, horrific killers and stuff. And I guess that will probably, well, that'll bring me on, I guess, it, not a teacher by any means, but obviously worked in a school, right. which was, was the yeah. Ian Huntley. Uh, and, and again, with this story, this is an element of, of based on trust. When you think of this offence, people will know that is Ian Huntley. Uh, most people would have heard of him I think, because there's been a number of documentaries not that long ago uh, on, on TV about him. But um, uh, he wasn't a sole actor in this because you've got one picture up, but there was also another person, yeah. uh, his partner, I think it was his partner, I don't think he was married at the time, her, yeah. uh, Maxine Carr. Uh, and uh, they were involved in this. And, uh, and, 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 and this is a really one of those complicated things, one of those kind of offences you'll never know how this originally came about. We understand what happened, but it's one of those things. Was it opportunistic? 
Was it just because they happened to be there at that time or was it something that he was seeking to look to do? I don't know. Uh, and I don't imagine anybody else does, but uh, we do know that he committed a horrific crime. He killed two young, two young girls. Um, unfortunately, uh, people who might have seen the documentary, this was a man that was on TV mm. when they were searching for these two, um, two little girls because apparently they were shooting at that time, they were missing. Uh, and he came across, and I've seen the documentary, and he came across as reasonably plausible, reasonably plausible. However, being a prison officer for a long time, I'm suspicious of everybody. Um, and I looked at that, and I, even then I felt there's something wrong here. There's just something wrong. This was the last person to have seen these two children. Um, and, uh, but it's one of those things that, you know, they've got feelings. They can be right and they can be wrong. And was, was, am I right in thinking, because I'm a little bit out of my depth here, which is why I'm staying a little bit quieter today, because obviously there's so many infamous prisoners here. There's so many horrific crimes, and certainly yeah. some of them, especially specifically in Huntley, actually, they, they, they do sort of even cut into me quite deeply because, you know, I've got children. I think about the crimes that he committed and stuff like that. And also the way he then, as you're saying, went about it afterwards, yeah. going onto TV and saying, well, I'm going to help with the search and look for these. Yeah. But wasn't there something? thing how the checks with him starting at the school hadn't been done properly or he'd falsified them he'd used like a different name or a different address to... he, he'd moved from another area yeah uh, he was working i think it was a sort of a caretaker kind of job at the, the school that he was at and he'd moved from another area and there was information on this man about previous things that he'd been checked and investigated for in another area i can't remember where he came from and that information didn't travel with him when they were doing what they call the um uh, I forgot the name of them now. They do these, the, the checks you have to go through yeah, when you want yeah, to so, work uh, with children. It was, was a CRB, so like a uh, yeah, yeah. record check. And that, yeah. that would be an advanced CRB yeah. uh, to work with children in schools, of course. Uh, and somewhere along that line, that process, he was either employed before the checks came back or the checks were not followed through. Yeah. Uh, but either way, that's, that's, that's the situation. Ian Huntley will never get out of prison. He will be there for the rest of his life. I was going to say, we've just, we just had questions coming in saying, is, he, is Ian Huntley still alive? But yes, he's still alive. Yeah, still serving. Still serving. I, I think yeah. there was a period of time where he was going on hunger strike and stuff like that. But Maxine Carr's actually been released, hasn't she? She, was uh, released, she, she, she only was given, served a relatively short time. And she was given uh, an, anonymity, wasn't she? She was given yeah. a new, new um, identity yeah. and, and moved to a new yeah. area. Her, her, her crime basically was sort of protecting him on an alibi. Yeah. more than it, she didn't assist him in any of these things she didn't wasn't part of unlike when you think of um ian brady and myra hindley who were complicit together mm. in manipulating those children into that situation where they were horrifically murdered um this was slightly different I, he did this on his own back and then maxine carr was part of that uh, alibi system that he was she was with him that night or that day or somewhere else or whatever uh, I, I think she got five years i think and served about three of them i'm not quite sure but i know she uh, and she came out under sort of another name and, and we, we're, going to, we're going to come back to this because officer Gunnar and i were just chatting about this before we went live and we we're talking about whether this will whether there's the potential for this conversation to start flowing into the death penalty conversation because um, we all have our different <laughs> feelings on that whether we're going to do that today whether we'll do that separate we'll see how we go but but uh, certainly some, some of these people and ian huntley will definitely be I'm going to say a um, it would be somebody that we would reference should they or shouldn't they basically yeah. have have that space let's let's move on so um, I'm, going to, I'm going to come to, to a slightly different one because we, we have got some unfortunately I say unfortunately as part part of obviously what we do here um, is uh, some quite hard hitting ones with some hor yes. hor horrific moments. but what I'm going to do is I'm going to step to, to, to somebody behind bars actually yeah. um, so I'm going to come back to yeah Robert Maudsley yeah. well uh, infamous he is but there'll be many people that are watching this now today that go who's Robert Maudsley? I was going to say I, I don't we're think going a lot back of people quite have a long heard time. Uh, we're going back a relatively long time somewhere there if I just step off quickly yeah. in the 1970s he was uh, uh, ended up in prison um, and he ended up killing one if not two prisoners while he was in jail and they were sex offenders uh, so obviously he'd got access to them. I'm not quite sure how the system worked in those days, but he'd got access to them and he'd murdered the two of them. Uh, and then later on, he was literally um, what we call psyched off. He ended up in a psychiatric hospital where he set about doing exactly the same thing. And, 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 and oddly in a psychiatric hospital, there's probably relatively more freedom when you're in a psychiatric hospital than there may be than if you were in a prison where you can isolate prisoners down into segregation and into isolation cells. So in the psychiatric hospital, he, he did the same thing, Robert Mosley. I think it was five in total that he actually killed. 
Let, let's, let's, let's just pick up on that quickly before before we move on, because yeah. um, I, 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 I only discovered this when I obviously started started taking over prisons and started obviously getting 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 tours going and stuff. Was that when prisoners riot? They're not, or when when prisoners sort of revolt like that, it's very rare that they're looking to try and escape. What they're looking to do is cause damage, cause disruption. But also, if there's a VP wing or a VP section, they're looking to try and get to the VP section to effectively attack the, the, the VPs. It, there may be some risks in that. One of the things about prisoners when they when they arrive, we always sort of say in a prison system, secure the hospital, yeah, because that's where all the drugs are kept. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and secure anybody that may be on protection because that may be the next, if not the same time, people making their way to that way. Uh, you'll find these days that many prisoners, they, prisoners these days, they literally create whole prisons that are now what they call protected status. Yeah. Stafford Prison in the Midlands, uh, that whole prison is now being classified as um, a, a protected status. Uh, and, and I suppose that the department probably quite rightly has said it's better that we move them out of a, in a mixed environment straight away into a thing because they may be part of the problem if you end up with them uh, with a riot situation. But usually Ooh. the healthcare system's the first place they're going to make for. Yeah. They, that's what they're after. I, they're not all prisoners, of course. And some they don't all get involved in these things, but some do and some don't. Some are just there when it's happening. They can't go anywhere. Um, so they may be a part part of that riot and they just might be there and they'll just sit back I've known one or two prisoners in riots I've been to over the years and they've actually have a chat with them when you're taking them away in the bus to another prison all that they go ah, I just went back to my cell boss and nothing to do with me you know what am I going to do you know I'm getting out in three months time I don't want to be involved in this stuff and not all some enjoy it smashing it up and all that you know depends how good the camera systems are in prison to identify people that have committed it um, but now Google's going to wonder what's going on today because I'm seeing comments of people saying, just Google this guy, what a monster, and, and stuff like that. And there's people who, oh, yeah. who are jumping yeah, on and Google, all as we're talking about. So Google's going to be like, why is there people of a certain area all searching the same prisoner at the same time? Yeah. And it shows you how well conditioned we are because we talk about Googling people rather than an internet search. Oh. There's, more than, <laughs> there's obviously more than one search engine. So the other people are going, wait, what about us guys? What about Bing? Ask Jeeves. <laughs> what about Bing? We're all on. We can, we can have an officer good with a search do. engine. Yeah, we do. Um, but it, I, and you know what, you've just, you just touched on something there, which I think uh, we, we I think it was last week we briefly mentioned it. It might be the week before we were talking about how New Zealand prisons have their way in terms of how they imprison their terrorists um, and their extremists because yeah. they do it by batching them all into one yeah. place. And the argument that they that they had now is I was watching a documentary on this and spent some time in New Zealand and at a similar time was their argument was well you can separate them and then you have to have lots of maximum security spaces yes. and areas within jails yeah. or you can put them all together so you only have to have one and only and you can condense it and that reduces the cost the downside of that is there's the argument that they will then um uh, spend time together and they will almost convert each other and push each other on but they made the point that these guys are already extremists they're yeah. not converting other people who might no, coming to that well, no, there's there. a big risk. I mean, you must, um, uh, in, in this country in the late 1960s, there was a great big, huge review called the Mountbatten Report. Yeah. And it was basically based on um, uh, really extremely dangerous prisoners, people like that, uh, and your craze and your, and your other kinds of terrorists, all those different things. Uh, and there was a thought by Mountbatten that he should build a place on um, the Isle of Wight. And he was going to call it Vector, and he was going to put machine guns around the outside, <laughs> clear about 500 metres of space, and anybody that stepped into it, and they were going to put all what you call your really rotten apples in one place. Yeah. But they decided instead to come up with a thing called the dispersal system. And it's still mostly in operation today, where they put a category A status on the most dangerous and disperse them through high security prisons within the country. We call them high security estate these days. They used to be called dispersal prisons when I um, when I was serving. Prison, prisons within prisons, aren't they? Yeah. Well, but bearing in mind, Ian Brady was actually in Garchi when I was there. Yeah. Uh, Ian Brady hasn't always been in a psychiatric hospital. He spent probably the first nearly 20 years uh, of his sentence in normal prisons, but he was on segregation when I was at Gartry. He wasn't part of the mixed population for obvious reasons. For obvious reasons, he was under the protected status. And in the end, he became um, the, the, what they call psyched him off. And he ended up going to a psychiatric hospital, which he never, ever got released from. 
uh, and never came back to a prison system. He, he literally died in those places. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll have to pick some of these bits up. And Harry, I'm sort of looking over to you and throw the pen back at you. Um, is because um, I, I think with, with sex offenders, again, as you were just saying, they're putting sex offenders in one place and there'll be an argument as to whether that's a good idea or not, because again, they will talk to each other about the crimes. There's that that was yeah. a huge piece around the SOTP programs, which yeah. for those of you that, that don't know is uh, the sex offender treatment programs. These are the, the programs that used to be done by the psychological psychology department thank you officer goodwin uh, by the psychology department um, in prisons like shepton and stuff like that it was a, a few specialist prisons around the country and it actually came out that i think it was a, a few years ago now that the sotp program was actually more damaging than it was successful because it encouraged prisoners to talk together about their crimes and actually other prisoners were learning from it and almost uh, you know getting getting they, they, a lot they, did, from it. they did some research yeah. and they found out that pre prisoners that had never been on uh, the SOTP, the Sex Offenders Treatments Program, committed or reoffended at a much lower rate than those that had already yeah. been on the course. So, now that's the research. I'm not saying that it's absolutely right, even, but it's part of the research yeah. that I actually had a regular. And I, I had this debate with, with with Emma, with my wife, who was a psychologist, and she ran SOTP um, programs at Sheptomalik Prison. And even the person that wrote the SOTP program stated yeah. that it's not an appropriate program and it should be done in yeah. a different way. And I think I think that goes to say it all, doesn't it? When the person that created it goes, actually, this isn't the right program, mm -hmm. you, you you start saying the problem with programs like that, which are extremely difficult to run anyway, you never quite know whether anything's successful until you put it up and test the system. Yeah. And you have to test it over a number of years because it'll take that long to get any feedback from it um, or you don't do it at all but should we, like all things have to be tested but let's let's move on. on otherwise otherwise we'll get we'll get stuck in i'll put this one up because you're you're stood in the right place um, so it seems to make sense okay levi belfield uh he's got a date there i think it's 2008 now I think, sorry i think it was 2008 maybe um he's um he's responsible for a number of, of, of murders and rapes uh, and eventually got pulled for um, a young girl that we do know of uh, because she's been in the new media for quite a long time, sadly, sadly, a young girl called Millie Dowler uh, because um, they literally couldn't find who did it and, they could, and then he got arrested later on. So it was a number of years after the event that he got pulled for the Millie Dowler because of another offence he committed after the offence and found out that he committed offences before that as well. Um, people may remember the name uh, uh, Millie simply because there was a, a phone hacking scandal that took place in this country some years ago uh, and that poor girl unfortunately who had, had been uh, brutally uh, murdered um, they were accessing her telephone um, to find out information basically for no other reason than to put it into the news media uh, and I think that was horrendous and uh, virtually nobody had ever been, really been taken to task over that. They had a big investigation over it, um, but you can imagine the, how, how horrified their parents must have been and brothers and sisters and friends and all that to know that somebody had gone in and hacked the young girl's phone after she died. Uh, yeah, I just, I can't get my head around that. I really can't. I look, I worry about our moral values sometimes. He actually you know, just... What we consider to be news and, and generally right. Uh, yeah, because he's, he's, he's at Franklin, he's at HMP Franklin, but in yeah. December he um, contracted COVID. Um, All right. as, as many as many prisoners did yeah. um and he's you know so he would have got, he would have gone through the covid battle which i'm sure he's probably out the other side now because it was it was it was december um but yeah so we obviously do see updates about about yeah. certain prisoners at, at different points yeah um, okay i'm gonna uh, probably yeah. get you to so um, more, more many people have forgotten about him because it's about an age thing as well 2008 isn't that long ago yeah uh, but he's sort of semi forgotten to be honest with you and, and there's there's some comments here. I'll, I'll pick this up quickly. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll bring a photo up in the yeah. next one as we bring this up. But Rebecca said, how do you distance yourself from what they did? Um, she's saying that she's not sure she could stay calm around people like this. And certainly yeah. okay. people that harm anyone, but especially children. So how do yeah. you go about that? I'm yeah. going to put the next picture up as well. Yeah. And Harry Roberts, and I'm going to let you take all that in one go. All right, then. Okay, yeah. Harry Roberts, 1966. Harry Roberts was a part of a, I'd say, a relatively small time criminal. Uh, he and two others whom you've never heard of, and I even I can't remember who they are now, um, just behind Wormwood Scrubs prison in the 60s, uh, they got pulled up by um, three police officers in uh, plain clothes, I believe they were, in a car, and they literally murdered the three police officers there. Remember, these police officers were not armed. These were not armed officers. They got murdered by three, and Harry Roberts is one of them. He tends to be the one that's been mentioned the most 
although there were the other two uh, as well. Harry Roberts, uh, I would have thought, because he just missed the death penalty, you can see by the date there, he would have missed the death penalty, not by very much, but he, he, the death penalty was literally stopped in 1965. Yeah, he missed uh, it by, by uh, just under a year, I think. What surprises me about Harry Roberts being convicted of killing three police officers is actually, I would have thought that he would have had what they call a whole life tariff, in other words, never to be released from prison. However, he was released from prison about five years ago now, I believe. I think he served something like 48 years. Yes, right. Do you know what? I'm always impressed, Officer Goodwin. I like to think my knowledge is good, but I don't know how you contain all this information because you're absolutely right. I've got the notes here. He did 48 years in prison and he was released in 2014. When you get to my age, you ain't got to worry about mortgages, <laughs> job, nothing. You just got to worry about what I know in my age. But no, I, I do. I, I take, I've always taken an active interest yeah, from, uh, Morris reading and stuff like that. But. Morris has just said actually he was he was uh, do you know what? and Morris as well it's impressive too Let, young, younger G as we like to call him yes yeah, yeah, Mr G. Young G um, uh, he he was the longest serving prisoner yes sixty six to, to fourteen yeah uh, yeah I, I remember Harry Roberts when he was at Gartry Prison and of course that's going back to the nineteen eighties so he was still a category A prisoner right up until at least when I I didn't leave Gartry till nineteen eighty eight. And he was still a category A prisoner at that time. So 20 odd years, he was still category A. Uh, over the years, he did get sort of downgraded uh, where he ended up in lower security prisons and obviously in the end released, which surprised me. I must be honest, I was surprised when he was released. You would have thought for killing three police officers um, who were obviously on duty as well um, and uh, pulled these guys up because they thought they were acting suspiciously, which they were. Um, basically, um, I, I thought that you're not getting out. Ever. It's a difficult one, isn't it? Because, I mean, yeah. he was released, I think he, he must be about 78, oh, 78 yeah, yeah. 79 when he was yeah. released. So the assumption will be there's no danger to the public, which well, is why he could be released well, one of why the, he could be whether he should yeah. be or not oddly enough when they decide when a prisoner is coming up to what they call their tariff date on a life sentence about whether they think it's right to, for them to be released or they should be served longer very often it's not about the offense it's about the risk yeah they look at the risk of a prisoner when yeah. they get out again not the offense now when you think of the offense with harry roberts you just say well there's no argument here no well he missed the day if, if he you're not going it, anywhere if they look it, at his risk in society he missed it by eight months the death penalty yeah. was struck off eight months before so in theory if he'd done that crime 10 months earlier yeah he could have had a death sentence uh, yes and probably might have done under those circumstances even though it was a rare thing in those but by days. eight months you miss it yeah and then like you're saying obviously because of the crime should really have had life but because he will have been deemed no longer a risk to society yeah. he will have been released um and part of that i guess that that there almost there must be a debate in there from a from a political standpoint of well now we're not having to pay for him in the same sense yeah. because he'll yeah. go off into the world and he'll yeah. be part of the pension scheme, part of a different pot of money. I'm not sure that would be their criteria. I think they're basic on, on risk and is he a risk to the public? Uh, and that may not, and for many people, they might go, no, the, the actual nature of the offence should take account as well. Uh, but then judges set these tariff dates depending on the circumstances of the crime that they're the sentencing prisoners for on yeah. the tariff dates. But yeah, Harry Roberts, he's, he's still out and about somewhere today. Um, you'd be on a life license, by the way. Many people yeah. forget that when you come out on a life sentence, you stay in a life license, basically until you die or 100 years, whichever one comes first. Um, so, yeah, so there'd be conditions on his license about where he can live and what he can do. Depending on who you are, it will depend on the license conditions that you, you have to live under. And, and but they're technically still a prisoner. Yeah. They're still a life sentence prisoner. They're just allowed to live outside prison walls, basically. And it's interesting because when they're on license, they can't even have things like fireworks or sparklers no. or anything like that. No, they'll have that. a life so, license against firearms. Yeah. So which, Automatic. Which, which, which would include yeah. sparklers. I think, um, I think I might be wrong with this. I think if you serve over four years in a prison, you may end up with a life license, uh, a lifetime of firearms bans, regardless so, of the offence. So but I may be slightly wrong with will, that. Might be will he get a new identity? Who? A Harry Roberts. No, no, I don't believe so. Yeah. No, I, I certainly didn't see that. And that's no. what we were looking at. No, they, they, they'd probably look at it and say he's at, at a very, very low risk of having any problems on the street by the public in jail. Most people wouldn't recognise him walking around the street. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna move on. Some, on. We're gonna move on some tougher ones now that people yeah. will absolutely recognise because they they are more recent and they are they are pretty horrific as well. Phil's just asked, will this be possible to watch later? Absolutely, Phil. It'll be up on the um, Facebook page, on the Shrewsbury page, the, Sh the Shepton Mallet page, the Officer Goodwin page, and also on the YouTube channel. So you'll absolutely be able to view it later. But Okay, let's move on to something that was uh, well, more recent. 
Okay, well, I'll just come in between there where you yeah. can see better. These are two young boys, uh, Robert Thompson and John Venables. Uh, it's always referred to as the uh, Jamie Bulger uh, case, the Jamie, the, the Bulger boys and all that. Uh, I don't think that's a, a very nice way to describe this, yeah, because agree. what you're doing is you're bringing up the victim's name all, all the time in this. And many people will understand this crime. These boys were just over, well, what was their date of birth, 90? Uh, it was 93, they were sent, to, it was 93 yeah. when they came to crime. Yeah, I, I it's hard check, to imagine, they, it was quite a long time ago now. They were, you they were young. Uh, yeah. Um, so the reality is with that is that um, they um, they were just over 10 years old, I believe, because you have to be 10 or older to be responsible in law for the they, crimes that you yeah, commit. Under 10. the age of 10, you can't, there's virtually nothing yeah, you can do. They were, they were 10 years old, yeah. Yeah, they were 10 years old. Uh, and, and for all those that may not be aware of this offence, this is where they took a young boy called Jamie Bulger away from inside a shopping centre and ended up down some railway track uh, where Jamie Bulger was, uh, was killed. Uh, horrific. Yeah, I don't think we'll ever know the full details of exactly what took place there because the only two that were witnesses to that crime were those two boys there. Um, and and uh, you have to ask 10 years old how, how they would manage to tell the truth or even understand those processes. I don't know. Um, but they would have had adults with them. They wouldn't have been questioned on their own, of course. But uh, yeah, uh, quite horrific. But just uh, because we, and unfortunately, it is extremely rare. It's extremely rare that these offences are committed by these age children, thankfully. Uh, but there is somebody else you may have a picture of there you could pop up there, Joel, I don't know. Yeah, um, I have, yeah. Uh, so just I, was just, I, was just, I was just reading the comments and, and, and just yeah. move on. It's really interesting uh, to, to see, and, it, and it, I, I'm really pleased to sort of see different people with, with, with different opinions coming through and, and the way people are putting them forwards. And, and something that we spend a lot of time on in, in dark tourism specifically is around how people perceive it because there are lots of people on here at the moment commenting saying that they should have had the death penalty yeah. that these boys are sick and that they, they, they should be shot there's, there's lots of comments against them yeah. and obviously these are 10 year old children they did commit a horrific crime but there's other criminals that we've shown already that committed equally as awful crimes or even worse but because they were further back, back. in history yeah. they're not necessarily seen as quite in the same way and, and harriet we find that quite a lot don't we as we're yeah. as we're working through why aren't the craze actually looked at and go, God, they were awful. But actually people look at them and they, they give them the infamy. They, it's, they it's, have a slightly anti-hero yeah, feel about them. Um, As does uh, uh, Charlie Bronson, who now changed his name to Salvador. Somebody asked about him. Spent a lot of time in yeah. prison, but a lot of people have made films about uh, uh, Charlie or Salvador. Uh, and, and basically some people see him as a little bit of an anti-hero, sort of a good, not a good guy, but you know what I mean? Uh, but, but, but not in the same but, terms. But, the, the year that it happened, the more recently it happened, the more people, the, the more emotive it is because people can remember it. I can clearly remember this. I mean, I was 10 at the time. I, I was the same age as these boys at the time. I was born at the same time as these boys in, in Well, in you have to bear in mind that um, with media the way it is today, this isn't on TV for a day or yeah. two uh, on the news and then it disappears out of sort of sight, out of sight, out of mind. Um, this stays on for time and time again and it gets rehashed by the media who bring up different documentaries. Then you've got the psychology people bringing up the different documentaries. So it stays within our in our emotional place for a long time. Uh, when Joel brings up this next picture now, if you yeah, would please, say, my yeah, friend, yeah. Um, you'll see a young girl there, and that girl's name is Mary Bell. Mary Bell in the 60s, I think about 1966, 67, it might have been fraction later, 68, she was responsible for, she was 10 years old or 11 years old, she was responsible for the murder of two young children, and she strangled those. So when you look at the difference between the two crimes, she actively apparently strangled them, which means there may be some element of more intent, um, rather than well, when you look at the Bulger case where they literally stoned him uh, 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 to death. So um, yeah, Mary Bell served just on 10 years, I believe, uh, from the age of 10, she obviously would go into young, uh, what they call secure homes in those days, and she got released after 10 years and never ever been heard of since. I believe she's still alive today. She'd been in her 60s and she had a daughter and, or has a daughter. Uh, I remember they changed her name when she left uh, prison so she wouldn't be identified today by anybody, probably not recognised either. But believe it or not, most people remember 
uh, she was virtually forgotten. Uh, she was mentioned once or twice over the years, but I'm talking about once or twice over 40 odd years. Uh, whereas you think of sometimes with the young, uh, the Thompson and Venable case, you've got a situation where it's been brought up and sort of, I don't know, forensically investigated, as they say. Um, uh, but Mary Bell basically did just on 10 years got out, which is roughly about the same time as Venables and Thompson did. However, one of them came back to prison as an adult. They did, and I think and the did. there's another there's another piece that's not not right for us to do today. We need somebody far far more intelligent than than myself in terms of from a psychology background. I think in terms of the condition, what prison did to those boys, right. and, and the conditioning of that, and, yes. and what that environment did. But yeah. like I say, that's not uh, one for me to yeah, pick up. And, and, and sure. Mary Bell, if you actually look at the story of Mary Bell, which you can find on an internet search quite easily, um, she had a horrific life as a young girl being brought up as horrific life within her home life. And you have to ask the question, whether it's right or wrong, or whether we agree or disagree, you have to ask the question, was that home life a part of what conditioned her thinking that made her think along those lines or lose that sense of empathy, lose that sense of sympathy, lose that sense of caring or emotion? I don't know, but she did have an horrific life. I can't speak for the, uh, the, the, the two boys uh, Venable and Thompson. I, I not really looked into their background of their lives, but I can tell you that Mary Bell had an horrific life as a young girl, horrific life, which may or may not have affected her thinking. But uh, I'm not justifying it. I'm just saying these things have to be taken into account. Uh, absolutely, which I assume the yeah. judges do when they when they make these decisions. Yeah, I, the judge for 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 um, uh, uh, Venables and for, for Thompson very much said that the public need is for you to have a long custodial sentence that is yes. that you know that is that, yes. that is a yes. necessity yeah and, and some the person that said there about when you take people into prison at a young age and keep them uh they're never going to grow up under the normal environments that our children grow up they're not going to go to a school and mix with boys and girls and go out to play at night they're not going to do any of those things that are part of our normal socialization and part of our normal growing up system that we get to holding a hand of a girl having your first kiss mm -hmm. your first relationship none of those things are going to happen at that stage so whether that has an effect or not i don't know about some, their ability to build relationships really when they're older. interesting comments here and this is going to lead us very much into uh, possibly next week maybe the week after but i think we should try and do it soon around that conversation around the death penalty and who should and who shouldn't because there is lots of comments coming oh, there will about, be. about who should and who should it's a big subject um, we can cover on its and, own and also there's 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 the comments about how it's how people are brought up. And I guess it's that argument between nature versus nurture. nurture. And again, that does need, unfortunately, it needs somebody more intelligent than myself mm -hmm. um, to be able to, to, to be able to bounce that off with, with Graham and really have that debate because I just don't have the knowledge or the qualifications to do that. Let me, let me move on to the last one because we're, we've done our 47 minutes. Oh, good. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll roll on to the last one and I'm sure most people will recognize um, these two. Okay, I might just be able to squeeze between there so you can see yeah. slightly clearer. Uh, yeah, you've got Fred and Rose West just there. Many people have heard of this because once again, this has not only been rehashed through documentaries over the many, many years, it, it's also uh, had a TV program made about yeah. it. I think I forgot the name of the actor, played a wonderful part in it. I think it was called An Appropriate Adult, the program was called. I think it was Ruth Wilson or... Dominique West and Rachel Wilson, I think her name was, who played the part. I think because, Harriet just got, sorry, I just interrupt. I think Harriet just got heard for the very first time I, live yeah, on yeah. air. <laughs> yeah. She is real, guys. She is real. She's not just a figment um, that we yeah, pretend now, she's When you think the reason the program was called an appropriate adult, Fred West would have been treated as um, a person with learning behavior difficulties. And that's why he had to have an appropriate adult with him, just like you'd put with a child, simply because he didn't have any parents that could sort of be there for him. And they're exclusive to a solicitor. Uh, that person is only there to be able to possibly make sure that they, to, I don't know really quite what their function is, to be honest with you, but they're called an appropriate adult. Uh, and solicitors are separate again. They're not there to do that kind of work with the prisoner. Um, so yeah, Fred West has spent quite a few years in prison, in Gloucester prison, exactly. I'll tell you an interesting story about yeah. Gloucester prison. He was in there as a relatively small town crook, way back to the 60s and the 70s. And um, on the end of one of the wings, uh, where the old hospital used to be uh, in, in Gloucester prison, um, basically, some prisons, when they were out around that area, they'd scratch their names into the brick walls. So that just leave their mark like Kilroy was here, that kind of stuff. And his name was scratched in there until such time as he got arrested for these offences. 
He only stopped in Gloucester for one night because of his series of his crimes. He'd be automatically classified as a potentially category A prisoner. He was moved to Birmingham, where in short order, he took his own life. However, if you go, you can't get into Gloucester prison. Now it's closed and sealed up by the people that have bought it. Uh, you'll find that uh, I know I've been inside it since uh, that his name has been taken off the end of that wall because other prisoners have literally scratched that name out. They're not going to have that name up there with theirs or any other in history. Prisoners would have considered that. No, not him. Uh, so, yeah, so you've got Fred West there. But remember, you've got complicit here because you've got Rose West, who's still alive and still serving a prison sentence at this moment in time, um, basically was complicit in that and actually convicted of one of the murders. I can't remember whether it was on her own child or not, to be honest with you. Um, but there's a number of people that have been murdered, about 12 or 13 or more, but they say there's potentially more than that. And it's potentially more than that. So there may be still people on the missing children's list that will never be known of again, sadly. And, and it's, um, it, it, this is actually one that I, I know a lot more about because we took over Gloucester a few years ago, 2017 in, in, in April. We, we did for Gloucester. Sure, well, yeah. uh, we ran it for 18 months before we decided to close it. And Fred West was a huge conversational yeah. piece that everybody used to ask us about and I, I made the decision very much I think you and I probably had the discussion Graham along with 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 a couple of the team a couple of our senior team and we made the decision very very early on that we would not discuss Fred West on tours we would not discuss his crimes we would not show people the cell that he was in oh. um, and there were varying reasons to that some of those reasons whereas Graham said he was he was he was in prison for a number of things there used to be a saying around Gloucester is, where's my bike? Oh, Fred's pinched it because he used to steal bikes, bike, like push bikes and stuff like that. So he used to spend time in Gloucester. And the reality is as well, because we knew the officer that was there. He used to work for us um, doing tours similar to, to Officer Goodwin. Um, so he was able to tell us exactly which cell Fred West was put in whilst he was there for I can't remember, it was one or two nights before he was moved to Birmingham. But he said the reality is that Fred West had been in a number of cells. And it was that kind of element of dark tourism, that element of macabre, where people wanted to go and stand in the cell that Fred West had been in. And it was a really, I guess, eye-opening, but very bizarre thought. Because to me, it never I would never have gone, well, I want to go stand in that cell. Because no. it, 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 it's a no. bit strange. But we made the decision very early on that we wouldn't discuss yeah. it because... Yeah. Um, there are many people that have that morbidity about yeah. about things that they hear. And, and family, uh, the, the victims' families still live locally to the town. And, and it's Absolutely. still there, so it is still very do, close yeah. to... I, I just wanted to answer, somebody mentioned there about how do you work, how do you as an officer, and other staff, yeah. not all, I mean, you've got nurses and teachers working, and other people working in prisons, officers probably have the biggest uh, amount of face time uh, with a prisoner. How do you manage that? Well, I, Gloucester you just reminded me of the story. I, when I first started in the service, my very, very first, uh, what I call initial posting, where you go for one month, just to find out what the prisons before you go to the training school was Gloucester Prison. And they had a special unit there, Sea Wing, and it was built in the 60s, originally for Borstal boys, then it became what they call a Rule 40, a National Rule 43. And those kind of offences that you see there, these are the kind of prisoners that were locked up. This is way back in the 70s, of course. And when I went in there for a look around, the training PO said to me, Graham, he said, I want you to grab a cup of coffee, go into that room there, he said, and pull out some records of these prisoners. I didn't know who they were at the time, by the way. It was just another wing to me. He said, have a good read of those for you. Have a good read of those, um, those records. And he said, can pop back and see who you finished. You give yourself an hour, hour and a half. And I did. And I read stories that prisoners have committed offences that, believe me, they horrified me. Because uh, very often you, you get the, the, the nitty gritty detail of an offence, which you don't see in the public domain. Very often in the public domain, you're going to get what they call a sort of a slightly cleaned up version of things because you're not going to get that. Back. And I read this stuff. Remember, I was 24 years old. I was truly horrified. Never, ever really had much contact or any much information about these things. And when I finished, I went back to the training payroll and he said to me, well, what do you think? And I said, well, I'm shocked. Governor. I'm horrified that any human being could do these things to other human beings. He said, well, I'm glad that you're shocked. He said, never, ever open a prisoner's record um, again, unless you have to, to do your job. He said, you do not want to be nosy starting reading about these people. He said, because you've got to go home and you've got to go home with all this stuff in your head. You've got a family, you've got a life to live. This is a job for you. He said, you don't need to read these things unless you have to. And obviously there are gonna be some that are infamous that you're gonna know just by seeing them. 
He said, because your job as a prison officer is to manage these people. Doesn't matter what you personally feel about them. It's not what you're paid to do. And, and it was probably one of the best bits of advice I was ever given. And I give that to many people that sort of thinking of joining the job. I said, don't be nosy. You'll find all these things out in your own time and when you least want to, because it may frame the way that you think about how you do your job. And I think sometimes that can be hard work. I was in this job for 38 years. And the reality is I don't want to be carrying that baggage around with me all my life. I really don't. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I've got the same emotions as everybody else about these offences. I really have. However, uh, I'm paid to do a particular job. Uh, so. And now you're paid to do a particularly different job. And I'm paid to do a, another job. A different, different job. Uh, it's just, uh, yeah. Which hopefully, at some point in 2021, we'll be able to get back to doing. Absolutely. I'm really uh, looking forward to getting the crowds back in. Uh, and, uh, I, might, I, might, I might see if we can just superimpose a crowd for you for next week. Just, I'm gonna, what I'm going to yeah. do is I'm going to get the heads put up well, whatever you do, don't so you, put, can, you can see heads in front of you. Like, yeah, uh, well, don't put Capitol Hill behind me. <laughs> right, <laughs> no. That's the last thing I need to see. Oh, God. You know, there's me talking uh, about wonderful people and you've got a picture of Capitol Hill. Uh, um, um, I, I'm not sure what we're going to do next week. We haven't actually, it's, you know what, we've run, out, we've run out of plan. What have you got on the book, sir? different kinds of prisons and prisoners. Yeah, one of the things we can do next week, a lot of people think prisons are just prisons and they're not. Uh, they, they come in a multitude of designs and styles and security levels. Remember you're talking about being able to lock people up from the age of 10 years old. They'll be in secure homes. Up to a certain age, they'll belong to what they call the Youth Justice Board. Yeah. So the Youth Justice teams will manage so we, prisoners. So be, then they move on to young offenders. He's going to go into it. He's going to go into it. Stop. No, no, this, just is gonna next, this is next week's episode. All we need to say is... Tune in next week. Next guys. episode is going to be about different prisons, different categories different of prisons, prisoners. how they how they go, yeah. how you how they progress up or, or down. down. Yeah, exactly right. Cool. So that's next week's episode. I think maybe the week after that we might have a conversation about potentially doing death penalty. Yes, um, which is very apt because our new studio happens to be directly above the execution <laughs> room where we're sitting um, in, where they use one of the old tackles. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so we're, anyway, we'll pick that up. So, uh, thank you very much, ladies and gents. Um, it's been a, an interesting yeah. one today, as they always Brilliant. are. Yeah. Obviously, a slightly different subject that we have to handle in a slightly different way. But next week, absolutely, we'll be back with mm -hmm. different types of prisoners and talk about those. Officer yeah. Goodwin. Thanks for your contributions, guys. Uh, look forward to seeing you, obviously, in the new year if you come around for a, a tour where I can tell you a lot more of those uh, dark little stories that uh, you can't really put out onto the public. Um, and uh, stay safe. Um, stay safe. Let's get this lot done and get our vaccinations and move on, please. And, and please, ladies and gents, do share the um, Officer Goodwin lives and share that we're going to be here yeah. for next week and the event so more people can tune in and start to see them. We want to see the same numbers as Joe Wicks, don't we? Yeah. Well, I, I want to be, I want my face to be so well known. I'm going to be invited on celebrity get me out of here so because I spent my life getting into somewhere called the prison. I want to find some way of getting out. So. I'm going to, I'm going to mute your microphone before we end up with Sir Graham Goodwin. Um, so anyway, I'm going to change my name. Thank you very I'll tell much. I'll a story about a prison. Thank you very much, ladies and gents. We'll see you next week. Thanks.